This is a very interesting article on identifying multiple sclerosis subtypes using unsupervised machine learning and MRI data from various clinical trials. So instead of relying on our subjective judgment with clinical phenotypes, maybe we should look at the MRI and be more objective, and this may correlate more with the underlying pathophysiology of the disease. For example, relapsing remitting MS, secondary progressive MS, primary progressive MS. I have a video explaining these subtypes types, but they're a little bit arbitrary and subjective, and they don't necessarily mean much in terms of the underlying disease which we're treating. And so I have to give credit to first author Arman Ashagi, who's a neuroscientist from the United Kingdom, for this excellent publication. And basically what they do is something called unsupervised machine learning. And I'll give an analogy to a chess computer. Back in the day, people used to design chess computers and say, the pawn is worth one, the bishop is worth three, the rook is worth five, your goal is to checkmate the king, maximize your evaluation function. Now they're saying with programs like Alpha Zero, the goal is to checkmate the king. You figure out what to do. You tell us what the intermediate goals are, the value of pieces, the value of certain positions. And that's exactly what they do. They let the machine group people with MS into categories of disease subtypes based on their MRI scans. And they use an algorithm called Sustain. And they actually give a score, which represents the degree of pathology seen on the MRI scan, but they let the machine divide people into different categories based on the specific findings. And so what they did was ingenious. They actually looked at a bunch of other randomized trials, sort of treatment trials for different medications, and they got access to the MRI scans. For example, define and confirm are trials for Tecrifidera. OPERA 1 and 2 are trials of Ocrevus in relapsing MS. ASCEND is a trial of Tysabri in secondary progressive MS. MS-STAT is a trial of Simvastatin in forms as Jeleni in progressive MS. You get the idea. So they looked at all these trials and they got all the MRI and then they let the computer go to work and they sort of generated these three categories. So in multiple sclerosis, you can have injury to a lot of different areas. Of course, the hallmark of MS is having lesions in the white matter, in the subcortical white matter, periventricular, juxtacortical, brainstem, cerebellar lesions. And that's what you think of as classic multiple sclerosis, which actually only ended up being about 25% of these patients had so-called lesion-led multiple sclerosis, where that was the predominant pathology. You can also have injury to the normal appearing white matter. So even in an area where there is no lesion, there's evidence of pathological changes both on multimodal MRI and in autopsy studies and biopsy sections and things like that. Now you can see this to some extent on conventional MRI, though not with the naked eye. And it turns out that normal appearing white matter that's damaged in multiple sclerosis has slightly reduced intensity in T1 sequences relative to T2 sequences. So the T1 sequences are slightly dark, even though the T2 sequences are not bright. So it's sort of a subtle black hole that humans can't see, but computers can. So some people, that's where they predict predominantly have their injury early on in the disease, and some people have cortex-led multiple sclerosis where early on in the disease they have a lot of cortical atrophy and loss of superficial gray matter. Now later on the disease, as you can see in the chart, it sort of starts affecting all of the other areas. But basically these subtypes are depending, dependent on how things are early on in the disease. Is the disease led by lesions, normal white matter lesions that we think of as being the hallmark? mark of multiple sclerosis? Is there a lot of injury to the normal appearing white matter or is a lot of the injury in the cortex in the superficial gray matter? Now interestingly the computer divides them pretty cleanly into different subtypes and so you can see this little triangle where they sort of plotted each individual person based on the degree of pathology in different regions and they could be tor more towards the lesion-led multiple sclerosis, cortex-led multiple sclerosis, and normal appearing white matter-led multiple sclerosis. And you can see while there are some in the middle who really truly do have about equal features in all three, many of them end up in distinct categories. And they even tried this on a second data set and certainly there were more that ended up in the middle, but still a lot of them 
seem to have predominant pathology in a certain area, mostly atrophy of the cortex, mostly developing new white matter lesions, mostly injury to the normal appearing white matter. And you can see many people rank in the 80th to 90th percentiles of certainty of assigning a certain probability to a dominant phenotype. Now let's take a closer look at these three so-called subtypes of multiple sclerosis. And you can see, let's focus on the training data set, not the validation data set. And you can see that 43% had cortex-led multiple sclerosis, 32% had normal appearing white matter led multiple sclerosis, and only a quarter, 25%, had lesion led multiple sclerosis, where new white matter lesions were the predominant pathology. Now, they all had the same average age, 43. The, they all had the same percentage that were females, about 64% or so, which is typical of MS in general. Now, let's look at disability. So this is EDSS, Expanded Disability Status Scale. It's a measure of disability disability in MS. I have a separate video on it if you want to take a look. Basically, zero means no disability. Three to four could be considered moderate disability. Six means a cane is required to walk 100 meters. And you can see disability was highest in the lesion-led multiple sclerosis, on average 4.5, and lowest in the normal appearing white matter-led multiple sclerosis, 3.5, and intermediate 4.0 in the cortex-led MS. Now, this probably has a lot to do with disease duration. So in lesion-led MS, they, on average, had MS longer prior to the study, nine years versus about five to six years. And the authors speculate that maybe people with lesion-led MS, it's more aggressive, it's associated with more relapses, with more new lesions, so they tend to get diagnosed earlier. There's less of a prodromal phase. They tend to have many more lesions, about 47 on average versus 10 and 18 on average. They make more new lesions. This is the placebo arms of the clinical trials, so 2.64 lesions versus 0.88 and 1.02. They have a lower brain volume, lower cortical volume, lower deep gray matter volume, and a higher baseline sustain score. So they just have more pathology overall, and they have a greater increase in the sustained store. So not only did they start off worse, but they get worse faster. So lesions in multiple sclerosis definitely matter. And there was this thought that maybe lesions don't matter as much as we thought we, they did. Maybe it's atrophy of the spinal cord and gray matter, or maybe subtle things that we can't see on MRI, like changes in the mitochondria or other changes within the individual cells. But this seems to say, no, lesions do matter, and people who make a lot of lesions tend to do worse with multiple sclerosis. Now, this is shown in graphical form. You can look at multiple sclerosis subtypes and the degree of disability progression, and there's not a huge difference, but definitely people with so-called lesion-led multiple sclerosis do progress a little bit more on the average, and this was statistically significant, and even more significant in the validation set. You can see, again, in the blue line, they had the most disability progression. Now, they looked at other things like relapse rate, and there was a trend towards people with lesion-led multiple sclerosis having more relapses, but it wasn't really statistically significant. And they also looked at the sustain score itself. And of course, if you have a higher sustain score, which means more injury to your brain on MRI, looking at all of the features, you tended to have more disability progression. So again, if you start off worse, you tend to get worse faster. Now, this is the most interesting thing, which is response to treatment. Now, they didn't look at all of the trials. They just looked at three of the clinical trials. One was Oratorio, which is Ocrevus in primary progressive MS. One was Ascend, which is Tysabri in progressive MS, which, by the way, was effective in decreasing progression of upper extremity dysfunction, but not in terms of uh, decreasing, worsening in a composite measure of disability, which is why Tysabri is not approved for secondary progressive MS. And the Olympus trial is an older trial on rituximab in primary progressive MS, which suggests that rituximab is effective in people who are younger and have gadolinium enhancing lesions. So these are progressive multiple sclerosis trials. The interesting thing is that not everyone benefited. The people with lesion-led multiple sclerosis seem to benefit from these drugs the most. People with normal appearing white matter 
lead multiple sclerosis tended to benefit intermediately, but people with cortex lead multiple sclerosis didn't benefit at all. No benefit versus placebo. And these are people who tended to have a lot of injury to the cortex or surface of the brain early on and not a lot of lesions and not a lot of changes in the normal appearing white matter, at least relative to the other groups. So this is very interesting. Maybe we could use this type of data to determine who would benefit from a particular treatment. So maybe this type of individual who has a lot of injury to the cortex with progressive multiple sclerosis, maybe Ocrevus, Tysabri, and Rituximab are not ideal treatments. And so I think this is really the beginning of designer treatments giving a specific treatment to a specific individual based on their phenotype of multiple sclerosis. Now, have the authors actually found new subtypes of multiple sclerosis? Well, not really. I mean, clinical subtypes are still very valuable. And as you can see from the chart I showed earlier, there's a ton of overlap. It's not really that some people are purely in one form or another. A lot of people are in the middle, but there's definitely a tendency for some people to have more injury to a certain aspect of the brain, the cortex, making new white matter lesions, or having this subtle, invisible injury in the normal appearing white matter. And this does seem to make a difference in treatment response. And maybe in the future, we can actually use this information to make better decisions and you know, be more evidence-based in our treatment of multiple sclerosis. But I'd love to know your thoughts. Do you have certain features on your MRI scan that may put you in a certain category, even if you weren't in the study or whatever? And what are your experiences with the medications? Did you have a good treatment response, in particular if you had progressive MS and you took either Tysabri, Ocrevus, or Rituximab? And do you have any suggestions for future videos?